Welcome to our paramedic education program in the first block and the probably the first course of any of the four courses in first block that you'll do is EMS 150 paramedic assessment and treatment. So this screencast has a bit of a course overview as well as some uh, tutorial on how to operate within our program in the online environment. And so let's get started. This course um, is really basically centered on bringing you from EMT assessment into the paramedic assessment world. It's a different paradigm. It's a different thought process, a different approach as opposed to assess, treat. Now you're assessing, coming up with a differential diagnosis or at least a, a short list of diagnoses, and then you're instigating some treatment. And so in order to set you up to succeed in the overall program, this course is the first in our first block and it is focused on the uh, paramedic assessment flowchart, the assessment inventory, and our underlying theme here is assessment, and we assess circulation, ventilation, and oxygenation, CVO. Uh, circulation, ventilation, and oxygenation. So we need to talk about shock and some other types of shock, and uh, then we'll get into lesson A for this uh, first course. Lesson A really brings out some assessment skills. Make sure that you understand how to do those basic assessment things uh, from as something as simple as getting an accurate blood pressure to capnography, pulse oximetry, that sort of thing. And then those assessment skills set you up to determine if you need to do emergent or immediate interventions. And then you move on to your assessment mnemonic of CVO, circulation, ventilation, and oxygenation. So on the flow chart, um, basically, we're looking to see, is this a code right off the bat? And I'm going to show you the flow chart in a minute. It's available on the website for you to download. And um, But I want to talk through the flow chart for just a little bit. So I'm going to move around on my screen here and uh, open up this flow chart. And uh, apparently turn it so we can see it right side up. So this is how we conceptualize assessment and treatment at the paramedic level. First of all, is this a cardiac arrest? If this is a code, then you're going to go to the cardiac arrest protocol and work it that way. And a bunch of things need to happen right off the bat before you come back and circle around and think about uh, what may be the differentials and the cause of the arrest. But most of our calls are not a code, and so you'll move right through that blue diamond, and now you're into CVO. We need to assess circulation through the use of BP, heart rate, skin condition, some uh, cardiology, EKG stuff. Also need to assess ventilation. That may include lung sounds. A check for strider may be, um, capnography may be involved there. And we need to assess oxygenation uh, with an assessment for some cyanosis if it's present and then pulse oximetry. CVO happens first before any emergent interventions or any um, attempt to determine a differential diagnosis, but it doesn't have to be circulation is all done first, and then ventilation is all done first, and then oxygenation is all done uh, third. It is, uh, th these can happen concurrently. You can be gathering uh, lots of information and, and delegating and, uh, and obtaining that uh, basic CVO assessment. Then you move into the green um, areas there. We call them the green blobs. I'm not sure why, but we do. Um, and the things in the green blobs are emergent, immediate interventions. If a person is choking, you're going to need to relieve that foreign body airway obstruction right away before we start getting blood pressures and asking sample history and all that sort of thing. And so the CVO leads you toward the green blobs. Some of these are going to happen regardless of the diagnosis. Most of these will happen emergently and immediately prior to determining and uh, doing a full investigation and getting your priorities and your field diagnosis. So we will give you laminated copies of this and the inventory, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, and these are really the, uh, the core, the foundation of this first course, which is mostly uh, considered foundational for the entire program. Um, so I talked a little bit about that. Um, and on the flow chart, again, we're looking for immediate, in, immediate interventions. And then you're going to get a focus history and physical that helps you figure out the differentials. And the differential list will then drive your treatments. Let me show you the inventory. I can get it to pop up here. This is not a checklist. 
This is an inventory. This is a list of all the things that you might do to help you with your assessment. You must consider all of these. You do not have to do all of these, but you must consider whether you should do all of these. And so it becomes very important for you to understand um, how to do each of these as well as to recall um, which of these fit into where. And so we have some assignments and some lab activities to help you in that direction. Again, the inventory is a list of everything that you must consider and you determine which ones you're going to do, which ones you're going to utilize. Uh, very few people are going to need all of those, but it helps you to prioritize and delegate. And we have some very cool uh, lab activities to help you um, get this straight in your mind. Again, CVO looks at the three major body processes of circulation, ventilation, and oxygenation. We've got to circulate blood, we've got to bring in fresh air, and we've got to get the oxygen from that air into the bloodstream. It's kind of uh, sounds simplistic, but it is so foundational and important. We want to emphasize it. Um, circulation discussion, we're going to talk about shock and define shock. Shock would be inadequate tissue perfusion. You should come out of EMT school already programmed to say that. And so inadequate tissue perfusion, inadequate delivery of oxygen to the cellular level. There's basically four categories of shock. You can have an obstructive shock, a hypovolemic shock, a cardiogenic shock, or a distributive. And we need to talk about what <clears throat> each of those involves. The obstructive shock is an obstruction to flow somewhere in the system. Somewhere in the cardiovascular system, there's an obstruction to flow. Tension pneumothorax would be an example. Uh, cardiac tamponade would be an example. But tension pneumo is one that we will talk about a lot in Lab A. So it could be that the person has inadequate tissue perfusion. They're in shock because of an obstruction to flow. It could also be that they're simply low on the fluid volume. They've lost blood or other fluid volume through any of several ways, and they are simply low on, on volume. And if you were to be able to increase their volume and return it to a more normal level, then their, their pressure would come up. Their blood pressure would come up and their perfusion would return. It could also be a pump problem. Because basically the cardiovascular system has a pump, a fluid volume, and then the container, the vascular container. And so a cardiogenic shock would be when the pump is not working. This could be in a large myocardial infarction. It could be uh, due to numerous other things that just cause the pump to not be functioning. Sepsis can end up being a reason why your pump is not functioning. And then we have distributive shock. That's container shock. That's because the container, the vascular container, the space within the vessels is inordinately large. It's inappropriately uh, dilated. And that's a distributive shock. There's several types of that neurogenic, anaphylactic, sepsis, septic shock, just to mention the uh, three. And then we have the various assessment options, your pulses, skin condition, heart rate, and blood pressure. As far as ventilation goes, we look at three things, rate, effort, and depth. These are foundational, and really you should come out of EMT school uh, knowing this. You may not have said it in that exact terminology, but how fast are they breathing? Too fast, too slow can be a problem. Are they using a lot of extra effort? Is it labored breathing? <clears throat> or are they simply not breathing deeply enough? Are they dead spacing? Dead spacing means that they're only moving air in the large transmitting pipes but they're of the airway, the, the main bronchi, and they, are, and they are not getting air down to the alveoli where the gas exchange occurs. Uh, capnography, in tidal CO2, capnography is a major tool to help us with that. 
Oxygenation is the third big process. Circulation, ventilation, oxygenation. We need adequate O2 content in the air. So if you're at high altitude or in a confined space or for whatever reason you have inadequate O2 that you're inspiring, you're not going to be able to oxygenate appropriately. But that's usually not the problem. What's usually the problem is that there's a problem in the process in the alveoli where gas exchange occurs. Uh, fluid buildup, um, infectious fluid in the case of pneumonia, um, pulmonary edema for in congestive heart failure are examples there. And then we use pulse oximetry to assess oxygenation, but it's not near as straightforward as capnography. Capnography is a real-time measurement that tells us how much carbon dioxide is being exhaled. Pulse ox has some limitations. There's a time lag, and we want to talk about that with you in this as well as in lab. And then lung sound assessment comes in there as well. So during lab A, and as you prep for lab A, we want you to look at the resource document. I'll show you that in a minute. We want you to learn in depth about pulse oximetry and figure out what shows an accurate reading and how you would know if it was an accurate reading, what things can fool it. Uh, we can get straight with carbon monoxide and nail polish and all this other stuff. We want to work on capnography so you understand uh, the number as well as the waveform and how to use the sensors and, and when the sensors can go bad and give you bad data and cause you to make uh, bad decisions or be confused on what's going on. Uh, ECG limb leads, there's the four leads, can be very, very helpful um, in terms of rate and rhythm. And we want to make sure you're putting those in the right place. We also want to make sure that you can obtain a BP via any of the several methods. You can auscultate when you can hear, you palpate when you can't hear, and you use a Doppler when you can't even palpate. And we want to talk very frankly and directly about the use of machine pressures and, and when you can trust them and how you would verify, the, verify those. And then lung sounds, lung sounds, and more lung sounds. We're also going to show you um, and work with you on um, doing really good bag mask ventilation. It's a key uh, tactic that we should all be able to do and be expert at. We'll show you the two thumbs down method, and we'll talk about appropriate use of the bag mask and ventilation technique. We'll do some work with oxygen therapy and we'll try to um, get an oxygen therapy protocol um, in, in your mind and, and well learned so that you're not confused and you're not putting non rebreathers on everybody. Um, and we'll talk about what PEEP is and how we deliver PEEP. How we deliver it with a PEEP valve on a bag valve mask or through a CPAP or BiPAP device and then also NEB treatments. These are some of the emergent interventions in the green blobs on that assessment flow chart, and we need to work with those. So drilling down on pulse oximetry, and again, there's a lot more information on your resource document. I'll show you how to access that here in just a second. But pulse oximetry is not real time. Your, your uh, reading may be one or two minutes old. You really want to know what the patient's pulse oximetry, what their oxygen saturation is in their aorta and their heart. But unfortunately, we can only measure it at their finger. And so it takes time for that blood to transmit, and we may have a stale signal. You may be seeing 88%, and he's really at 90, or he's really at 82. Uh, so there's a delay there. Don't forget that. Signal strength is really important. Uh, before you start believing the pulse ox, let's make sure it can at least count the pulse. So you would watch the blinking light or the waveform indicator off your pulse ox and match that to the patient's pulse. If those two match, then you can believe the oximetry reading is at least coming from a strong signal. You've got to have adequate perfusion. If your patient's pulse ox says 60 and his BP is 60, we don't really know what his pulse ox is because his BP is so low, his perfusion is so poor. So if we can get that BP to a normal range, then we can believe that pulse ox. And we'll go through that over and over. Plus, it can be fooled by carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide will give you a, a falsely high uh, pulse ox reading. Um, as I think everybody knows, coming out of EMT school. So capnography is real time. There's no delay. And it's measuring three body processes, which you really should uh, memorize for now and then begin to understand so that you can learn. Carbon dioxide is a byproduct of metabolism. So in order for CO2 to even be in the body, there has to be metabolism occurring at the cellular, cellular level, making the carbon dioxide. Then there has to be adequate circulation to bring that CO2 back to the lungs. So already we have to have metabolism in place and good circulation in place. 
if those two are in place and everything's going fine there, then you can tell how well someone's ventilating simply by the number and the waveform on the capnography. Lots of good stuff in your resource document about capno waveforms and um, how you can actually see wheezing by looking at a capnography waveform that looks like a shark fin as long as that shark is swimming to the left on your screen. So heart rate and breathing are something else we want to check and we really like to get you to uh, hold that radial pulse right off the bat. It's a great first step as soon as it's safe to do so. Let you touch your patient. Let you convey your caring to your patient. Let you feel their skin. Let you look at their breathing rate effort and depth while you hold their pulse. Some people will be conscious of it and, and change their breathing rate and such if they know you're watching. So I like to hold that radial pulse, see if it's even there. If it's there, that lets me estimate that their blood pressure is not terrible yet. It lets me check the rate and regularity, which you know would be a key to me to know that their heart is, is not beating fast enough or too fast, or there's an irregular heartbeat. Um, but So that radial pulse is really a great first step. After you've estimated that they do not have a terrible pressure or they do have a terrible pressure, then you want to quantitatively assess it. You want to measure it. We want to talk about how to size and place the cuff, how to auscultate, when to use the diaphragm, when to use the bell. There's great stuff in your resource document about that. When to palpate when you can't hear and then how to use a Doppler. We'll show you that in, um, in lab. And then... Um, really like machine pressures. Machines don't forget to take the pressure. They don't forget what they got. And they don't have to write it down. They just keep track of it. But uh, they're not always right. So really I think a good practice is to do a manual pressure first and then immediately put the machine cuff on the same arm at this, almost the same time as soon as you're done with your manual and verify that that machine's giving you something reasonable. Again, the two thumbs down video should be life changing for you. You should uh, never have problems after that, worrying with head tilt, chin lifts, and crazy things, you can do a great jaw thrust, put two thumbs down on the, on the face mask, and do an excellent job of managing the mask seal and maintaining the airway. And you can get anybody to squeeze the bag for you. So, great video from Ruben Strayer. You should watch that. It's part of your resource document. Bag mask ventilation is a key skill. If you can bag mask ventilate, you can get yourself out of some problems. There's an expert gentleman that I was fortunate enough to listen to at a conference, and he teaches anesthesiology, teaches trauma anesthetists that work at shock trauma in Baltimore. So this guy is teaching people who are at some of the best at what they do in the world. And his takeaway on all of airway and ventilation is that if you can ventilate with a bag valve mask, you can get yourself out of trouble and keep yourself from getting in trouble, and it is the key skill. And we tend to spend a lot of time on intubation technique and on and on and on. Bag, bag valve mass technique is critical. We're looking for normal chest rise. We're not looking for as much volume as we can put in. That adult bag valve mass holds three to five times the amount of air that a person needs. People need more air, more tidal volume when they're taller. Not when they're fatter, when they're taller. Now, if their chest is heavier... You're going to have more trouble with airway. You're going to have more trouble with ventilation. And you may need a second hand to add pressure in order to make their chest rise. But you certainly don't need that second hand to add volumes. So we want to work with you uh, persistently throughout the program and definitely in first block on that. Let's take a second here to get right with O2 therapy. The normal person with no lung disease has a, has a uh, target for O2 saturation of between 94 and 99 percent. By the way, it's a saturation. If you're saying stat, stop saying that because that's ridiculous and you sound stupid. You need people to trust you. So don't say stupid stuff because people will think you're stupid. It's not a stat. It's a sat. O2 saturation. The target is 94 to 99 percent. Not 100 percent. You want to get 100 percent on a test. You don't need 100 percent on pulse ox. Their pulse ox reading, their O2 saturation should be 94 to 99 unless they have lung disease. If they've got lung disease, we're going to have to adjust their normal down a little bit. And we're all perfectly capable of making this judgment. 
We don't need to be in the old, silly National Registry, seen safe, BSI, put a non-rebreather on everybody, which is just really silly. And we should stop being silly. We're supposed to be paramedics. So if they have lung disease, and let's adjust their normal down about 5%. So instead of 95%, a person without lung disease, then maybe 90, maybe the low 90s. Some of these guys may even run in the upper 80s. So, you know, adjust it down, do what makes sense, use a little bit of oxygen for a couple of minutes, and you should get some rise in that, in that uh, pulse ox. Two or three liters for two or three minutes ought to get you two or three points increase on the pulse ox. If you don't get that, there may be a ventilation problem. If you're going to need more than two or three points rise to get you to normal, then a cannula probably won't get you there for quite a while. Then you can use a non-rebreather. There's nothing wrong with non-rebreathers. But let's don't use them on people that have lung disease and a pulse ox of 93%. It doesn't make any sense. It's not physiologically necessary. It's bad medicine. So we should stop doing that. So regardless of whatever you've been taught in the past or heard or, or what the genius that works with you uh, at your station or on the medic unit with you, stop doing that. It doesn't make sense. Do what makes sense. If that pulse ox is not coming up, then maybe it's not just oxygenation, maybe it's ventilation. So we need to work on uh, understanding that, and we'll do some stuff in lab to talk about that. Now we need to talk about PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. Positive pressure at the end of expiration. And so what this does, when you can add PEEP, is you can get all the alveoli playing. When you take a normal breath, not all of your alveoli are opening up. A fair amount of your lung is not even doing anything. But when you need good oxygenation, you can add PEEP for your patient. It'll reduce their work of breathing. It'll prevent alveolar collapse called atelectasis. There's a term you should know, atelectasis. I find it hard to spell, sometimes hard to say, but I know what it means, and so should you. So PEEP will help you reduce that work of breathing, prevent that atelectasis. We can show you uh, the analogy with the balloon in the lab and talk about this a little bit. But PEEP is delivered via a PEEP valve attached to your bag valve mask or through a CPAP or BiPAP device. Now, conscious patients don't like that tight-fitting mask on the CPAP or BiPAP the first time they've had it. Once they've had it, they understand how much better it makes them, and they'll ask for it, and they want it. But if you're putting a, a CPAP mask, if you're delivering PEEP via CPAP or BiPAP for the first time for a patient, uh, it, it can be anxiety producing to the point where sometimes we have to sedate. The deal with PEEP is that it raises the interthoracic pressure. So we don't want to do this when somebody's blood pressure is very, very low. Now that's kind of, kind of a, a fuzzy concept there. And so pretty much when these folks have a systolic in the 80s or 90s, I would be cautious with PEEP and I would put it on, and if they really start to get worse, I'd take it right off. That's the thing about PEEP. You take it off, and the problem goes away. And so um, we do not want to put this on people that are very hypotensive, but that the very guy that may get the most benefit from this may well be in that kind of tenuous range, whereas systolic's in the 90s. And I just wanted to mention that right off the bat, that PEEP can reduce preload and reduce BP, uh, but we want to be careful. Uh, careful, but we don't want to completely ban the use of PEEP um, in those particular patients. Those will be some of your hardest patients to manage. And throughout this course, we'll work you in the direction of being able to solve those problems for your patient. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. That means there's a little bit of back pressure all the time, whether the patient's inhaling or exhaling. So when he's inhaling, that's not hurting him. It's, extra, it's easier on him. Uh, less work of breathing, but when he's exhaling, he is exhaling against a little bit of um, uh, the same amount of pressure as he's inhaling with. And I didn't explain that very well, but we'll get at it in lab and, and, and give you an idea there. Bi-level positive airway pressure, BiPAP, is probably better for patients. It's easier for patients because it does not um, have, have them working against the machine, so to speak. So we'll get after that in lab and, and get... Uh, Get some explanation for you there. NEB treatments, those are easy. A lot of you coming out of uh, EMT school and uh, hadn't seen them, but you've gone to work. If you're working on an ALS truck, you're probably even setting these up. We want to make sure you understand how to set them up correctly, how to interface them with a CPAP or BiPAP mask. 
when to use a mask, when to let the patient hold it, and then talk about dead spacing. Just because you've put a NEB treatment on a patient doesn't mean they're actually getting the medication if they're dead spacing. So this is a lot of stuff, um, and Lab A is busy. All the labs are busy, and uh, this will be great. Now, what I want to show you now is the website and um, help you navigate around there. So um, here you go to the learning site on our web page. Our web page is ems.bcfdmo.com. You go to the learning site, link here on, um, on the menu bar, go to paramedic, and then here's information about the program. Here are your first block courses. This course is EMS 150, and there are a number of assignments for you to do. Each assignment has a resource document. The resource documents for week three and, and, and going forward will have the link to the screencast in them. So I'm doing the screencast right now for week one because it's introductory to the program, to the course for sure, and to the program overall. So there's a separate link up there for this first time only. But there'll be a screencast for week three stuff, and that'll be on that resource document, right? So you come to the learning site, come to the paramedic program, come to the course that you're going to work on. Here's that assessment flow chart if you want to download it, the one I showed you earlier in the screencast. Here's the inventory, and here's um, the link to this document. And I'll also put just the slides in case you want to to uh, have the slides, you don't have to try to, to uh, copy notes down and such. You're going to want to go to assignment one and click on that. It will download for you. And then you're also going to want to open up the resource document. The resource document will have a number of links as well as lots of great information. And earlier I kept talking about all the good stuff that's in here. Here's the good stuff. Bunch of notes will sometimes ask you a question to help you test yourself. These are not the assignment questions. These are just questions inside the resource document. whole bunch of stuff on ventilation, capnography, orals and nasals, oral suctioning, bag valve mass technique, all kinds of good information here. It's all required. There's no fluffy foo-foo stuff. There's no nice to know. It's all got to know stuff, and it's all in there. So... How do you do this? Do you just watch a video or what? Well, what you really want to do is go back and watch this screencast after you've reviewed the assignment questions. And these you're going to turn in via email. And you're going to turn that in by the due date listed and to the person that we give you instructions for. And that will come to you in an email, an introduction to the program, introduction to the course email. Tell you where to send those. But basically, I would go down through here and, and answer the ones that I know. If I knew what PEEP stood for and what its function was, I'd write in my answer there. Then I would look at the resource materials, review the screencast, and make sure that I was right. Also, let's say I had no idea what the normal range for CAPNO was. So that would be one for me to say, I don't know, and I'm going to look up the answer. So adults learn best when they take new information and fit it into prior knowledge. This helps you document your prior knowledge and gives you an idea of what you need to go look for, listen for, and try to find out. You're investigating for answers rather than just watching a video. This is not a Wikipedia medic program. It's not a YouTube medic program. You don't just passively watch a video and learn from it at maximum efficiency. My guess is that most of you don't want to spend 20 hours trying to learn material that you can learn in four. So you want to work efficiently and effectively, and this is how it will, what will be most efficient and effective for you. Describe three things in the assessment inventory for radial pulse. Take a stab at that and then go back and look at that assessment inventory. Review the screencast, review the resources, and um, that should give you <clears throat> maximum efficiency and effectiveness in your learning. When you come to Lab A, we will give you a readiness check right off the bat. That's to see if you have prepared adequately to even participate in that lab. We're not going to let you waste time for other students. If you haven't prepped, you're not ready, and you shouldn't be slowing down folks that have prepped. So we do a readiness check. 
on this very first assignment and one time only, we're going to even tell you what's on the readiness check. If it's highlighted in yellow, that means we're going to ask you that on the readiness check. You can see that not everything is highlighted in yellow. Only the really big important things are highlighted in yellow. Big and important in that if you don't know them, you're going to be really slowing everybody down in lab and it will be less than effective. So take a peek at these. Be ready for at least those four questions on a readiness check as soon as you walk into class. And uh, submit this assignment according to the instructions that we're going to email you. And that's how this goes. The assignment is the key, the resource document, and the, um, the screencast that will be contained in future resource documents but is separately uh, listed here. This is how you do this. And this is how this, this very effective process works. If you'll work the process, it'll work for you. If you don't work it, you just don't absorb things. You're not going to learn by just reading a textbook. You're not going to learn by just watching videos. You have to engage actively. And this is how we help you learn to do that. So um, a little bit longer screencast than normal because I'm trying to explain all about the course, all about the program, and how some of this stuff works. Normally these things run about 15 minutes. This one I feel like has gone pretty long. I apologize for my terrible voice and the uh, interruptions and such. Um, and uh, so stick with us and welcome to the program.